First of all, I would like to start by passing our sincere condolences to all the victims. But here I would like to say it's France, Lebanon, Turkey, Palestine, and every other single country which is suffering from terrorism from Iraq to Syria to the rest of the world. Another point I would like to say, because I have heard this morning that there is a lot of nice things said about Islam. But then at the end of every discussion, we hear that there is one or two percent of the Muslims that they have to change their way of living or their way of thinking. Islam is one. We don't have multiple Islams. And if the intention is to change the way we Islams would think, that will be a disaster. So just for the record, when there was the war against Afghanistan, we believed it was done because of a political cause, because of terrorism. We've never labeled it as a crusade against a Muslim country. So I hope in our terminology, we tend to be very careful how we would like to address these issues. I come from Lebanon. I'm an industrialist, philanthropist. We work in all the region. And when I hear people wondering why we have terrorism and what are we going to be doing about it. Since 1948, the West has agreed that most of our governments in the Arab world tends to change and to migrate from democracies into police states because we have the conflict with the Arab-Israeli conflict. And our regimes normally, they try to convince us to try to protect the state, then we have to make sure to take some of your civil liberties and your constitutional rights because this is the only way we can protect the future. We have 350 million people living in the MENA region. 60% are under the age of 30. Income per capita is one of the lowest in the world. We have 40% of the world energy, yet if we look at the improvement in the income per capita for our citizens, it's basically nothing. Now, under the so-called, before that, interest, strategic interest in the region, whereby we were the number one strategic partners for the West for the oil and gas, we were protected and the West agreed that the, the civil society doesn't exist, but it's okay, we understand, because we need stability in the region. Obviously, after 20, 2009, 2010, there has been more findings of oil and gas around the world, and specifically in the United States, which will be coming very soon an exporter of gas. And they, we are not anymore the main strategic partner for the oil and gas sector in the world. So all of a sudden, the pressure was released from us, and all of these tensions that our young men and women, that they believe that they have no future, Realize this is the opportunity to just to air out their beliefs. I was in Egypt five days before the, 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 the Intifada, you know, before the up, uh, uprising that happened. The slogans there were, we want to live and we want to eat. It wasn't an issue about democracy, freedom, and, you know, elections and all of this. But in order to justify whatever happened after 2011, we had to take it to the next level up by the media in order to justify that there should be a need for a political intervention in the region rather than to start looking into developing the future of these young men and women. When we talk about immigration, illegal immigration, Africa in 1950 was half of the population of the West, of Europe. By 2050, it's going to be three times they're surrounded by oceans, and the only way forward is Europe. Look at the Middle East. When people are trying to see they want a future, we in Lebanon, I'll give you a very good experience, 60% of our people, they do not engage in public life because they believe the same people that took us to war in 1975 are ruling us today. So what future is there for the young men and women to believe that they have a role? in this, their society. So they have given up. They have resigned their role as citizens. And unfortunately, when young people, they see with the social media what's happening around the world, then basically they're looking for an alternative. If we do not, all of us, work together to offer the alternative for these young men and women, there is the alternative, which is terrorism, which is unfortunately attracting them for the wrong reasons. When in Lebanon today, the minimum pay for a family of four is $500, and when you have Daesh offering $800 and $1,000, then basically we are not really encouraging our young people to start looking within the institutions. 
Lebanon today, we are 4.2 million. We have 1.6 million Syrians, 400,000 Palestinians, plus or minus. And we don't have the institution in order to deal with these refugees. We and the Makhzoumi Foundation, we do a lot of work with the UNHCR. We tend to work with about 20,000 Syrians every month in, in Beirut. But it is the wrong way of dealing with it, because all what we do, we give them $200 and we'll tell them, go and live a family of four, five, six, which is out of the question, because with the cost of living, these people cannot even pass the 10th day of the month. While if we are going to be working together, we have young children that were born four or five years ago in Beirut. We have people that came, they were four or five years old when they came to Lebanon. A child who will spend the first six to 10 years of his life outside school, we've lost them to the society. These people are going to be pariah on society. When we look at all the artisanal of the Syrian people, that we all know that they were good technical people, when they're going to come to the Lebanon and they don't have a job, and they are trying to take menial jobs, unskilled labor from the, uh, from the, uh, from the Lebanese people. First, we're creating a sensitivity among the Lebanese, which is becoming a difficulty. And the second thing, which is most important, they are losing their skills. So if we are going to be encouraging them at some point to go back to Syria, what are they going to be involved in? Our suggestion, if we're going to be working as a group, which we hear today you know, on security matters, how about development? Europe is spending a lot of money. You know, the beauty about Europe, you pay, but you don't get the revenue for what you are paying for because you're supposed to be our neighbors and you're supposed to pay, which is fine. Thank you very much. But the bottom line, let's work with you in order to invest your money where it's at some point you want these migrants to come to you, at least we would have trained them, we would have given them exactly the, the right education that you want, because you need them at some point. Today, Europe, 25% of the population are under the age or over the age of 60. By the year 2050, the rate of loss of population will be 32 million, because the rate of death is going to be more than the rate of birth. And worse than that, if we look at it. Today, the medium age of the European is 30 years. In 2050, will be 36 years. In 2100, is going to be 42 years. So you need these migrants. But instead of labeling everybody to be a terrorist, let's work with you at source where we have them. Let's train them. Let's give them the proper education. So if you want to choose, choose a good one in order to move forward. But that does not relieve us, all of us, from the responsibility that we have to train these people in order not to allow them to become pariah for society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mr. Makzumi. 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 Mak. OK. Uh, when I listen to you, I think in that if in Europe we have some politicians like you that know the political field, by the other hand, know and touch the development, but in the human dimension, I was very happy about that. So uh, because uh, the gentleman is obliged to leave, we can take questions directly now for the gentleman with the permission of the lady and the other persons. Uh, and. Uh, we leave him to continue his important meetings here in Brussels. Who like to put questions? Okay, we start uh, by uh, Tevan, not you, the other one, and after Tevan. You take three questions together. Take as many as you want. But, but uh, we you are like here to get, serve. Yeah, you like together or? Uh, you choose. You're the boss. Okay. Okay. Um, merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you are speaking about refugees and uh, uh, how they have to be trained. You ask to have them trained in our countries. Don't you think that our countries do need trained persons, don't you think that it's in those countries that we have to solve the problems? In Lebanon, you have about 200 uh, crafts, uh, that professions that the Palestinians cannot uh, work for. 
uh, about the Syrians, they are good workers, but Syria also needs Uh, the, well, the Syrians were known for not liking to emigrate. Uh, now we're dealing with a very specific problem, which is the Syrian refugees that are in Lebanon, in Jordan, they are in Turkey, and there are millions of them. The largest contingency of refugees in the world has been generated out of the Syrian problem. So for us, the biggest cause of all problems in the region, the mother of all problems, is the Arab-Israeli conflict. So the unfortunate part is that the Arab-Israeli conflict was hijacked by Iran after the Oslo agreement. Then it was hijacked by Turkey when, you know, after the famous uh, Davos meeting that there was the conflict, you know, and the statement between Erdogan and Shimon Peres. And now, basically, it's lost somewhere in between because it's no more a priority. The biggest issue, the biggest number of refugees right now are the Syrians. And I think we have to do something about Syria because this was the extension by extension for Daesh and Syria and Iraq. If we don't start dealing with the immediate problems, we will be lost because there are so many levels of three-dimensional chess. We have a common enemy, and this is very important, I hope, for this meeting here, to define who's the enemy. Because we in the Arab world, we do not agree on the number one enemy. We have a list of enemies that they change priorities depending on the country. Today, the enemy is terrorism. Today, the enemy is Daesh, Jabhat al-Nusra, Muslim Brotherhood. All of these, they are abusing the, the, the religion for political reasons. If we can succeed in educating our people to shield Islam from politicians, then maybe we would be on the right direction. Uh. Who is the other? Who is Devan? Yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Marzumi, uh, as you started from the religious point of view, I would like to raise the question about Lebanese and its approaches to the region. Actually, now Lebanon, I think, the only country that yet preserving Christian community there. We lost in Egypt, we lost in Iraq, we lost in Syria, in reality, from the historic point, and now it's only in Lebanon. Do you think that it could be a problem to that the Lebanon would be the next on the road targeted by Islamic State as a country? And actually, your propositions, how to preserve the historical culture that is, has been around of these things there, because it's also part of the financing the terrorism. They're selling out the monuments, they're blowing up the churches, they're taking out a lot of paintings and cultures, and all this heritage is losing. Is the in Le for the next future? Lebanon was perceived to be a unique way of living. As a Muslim, I will demand and we will insist that the Christians will be part of our society. We do not want to be part of Syria. We do not want to be part of Iraq. We do not want to be part of any Islamic state because this is the way Lebanon is defined historically. Since the Ottoman Empire, we've been given our own independence, you know, some kind of autonomous that's there because of this mix that we have. We shouldn't be talking about maintaining the Christians or not. Lebanon is the last country in the Middle East with one third of the populations that are Christians, and we all demand that we do not change the structure of the country because this is helps us. I need the Christian to be talking to the West. I need the Muslim to be talking to the East. And this is one of the unique situations that we have in this country. Where we are having difficulty is that the political apparatus that we have is abusing the Muslim, Christian, Sunni, Shia conflict for these politicians to stay in power. Look at the presidency in Lebanon. We've been now for close to one and a half years with no president. Why? Because it's an insult for the Lebanese and insult for the Maronites that we are saying there are only two candidates and you have to choose one of them. One is supported by Saudi Arabia and one is supported by Iran. What are we saying about this country if I cannot get 128 members of the parliament to convene, which they have been refusing to convene in order to elect a president? Everybody has a role in Lebanon. We are all going to be building the Lebanon, but 
The process that we have started in Taif has neutralized Lebanon to the point that we don't have an institution. Tell me which country you cannot force the member of the parliament to go to vote. Because really, we do not have the institution. We have the pretext, but we really do not have the system to go. So I wouldn't worry about the Christians, because it is our interest, all of it, Lebanese interest, to make sure that the status quo is remained, and we will defend it, whatever it takes. OK. Uh, the lady. I'll go back to the younger generation and uh, the immigration problem. And you mentioned about the Syrian immigrants going into the neighboring countries, yet the research and the reports that have been published uh, pose the question why they don't go more and instead they try to go to Europe. This is one part. The second part is, how do we deal with the immigration of the younger generation all over the world? I'm sure that in Lebanon you have the same problem. At least the younger students, the bright students that I know from the past, most of them are in the States. And at this point, uh, the developed states, the developed countries, are taking advantage of cheap, bright minds, educated in their countries at a high cost, and leaving their countries leaving them there. Um, Madam, what you... Our foundation has trained about 400,000 Lebanese, not to the level of education of the university because there is no market for them, but on the, day, on the level of vocational training. Lebanese people, they do not feel that they have a role to say in their future because the political system does not allow it. The West has approved an election law that was created by the Syrians in 92, and they're keeping it because most of our politicians are for rent, and they decided to shift side from Syria to become anti-Syria, okay? This is the fact. I know that it's not nice to say it, but that's the, the, uh, the fact. If we are going, Lebanon needs 35,000 jobs new every year. We barely can produce 9,000. Now, you're saying there is a huge market for the Lebanese that there is no role in the country. How much is costing us every sortie that goes up to attack Daesh? Million dollars? How many have we done so far? What can we do with 20, 30 billion dollars to find jobs for all these people? And that's when we start winning them to stay in their country. Hey, it's Dr. Pilato from Atlantic Council of the United Kingdom. My question is, based on your last statement, you said train these people so they don't become a parasite in the society. So my question is, do we have the intention, the resources, and to what extent the nation states are willing to do so? As a Lebanese, I tell you, we have all the intentions. Whatever resources I have personally, you know, we're putting it to do there. But we're not governments. We are NGOs that are working to make sure to make life a better place for everybody. Instead of paying money through the UNHCR for the $200 that normally does not last for more than 10 days, for six or $700, I can train them to start becoming part of society. For a loan of $500 to $1,000 per family, you can start a microcredit program. So if you look at the money that's being spent on trying to maintain the status quo as we define it in the UNHCR, I think will get us nowhere because the refugees are becoming more, cost of living is becoming more, and more pariahs are going to stay outside the society. I think is other ah yes, come to a microphone, and this is the last question. I think. Yeah. Good good afternoon, sir. I have a microphone. All right. Yeah. So good afternoon, good afternoon, sir, and thank you for your, your presentation. Uh, my name is Serge Strobens, and I, I work for the Institute for Economics and Peace. And we have produced, uh, as every year, a global, peace, a global terrorist index that has been published last Tuesday and will be presented next Monday here in Brussels in an event that is co-sponsored by the ATA and the Belgian chapter. In the ter terrorist index this year, we see that there has been an exponential increase in the terrorist attacks after 2011 and the start of the uh, Syrian conflict. 
But we also see that only 2.6% of the uh, terrorist attacks occur in the West, in Western societies. And if you would deduce 9-11, this uh, amount would be reduced to 0 0.5. We also see that the flow of refugee coming to Europe is, of, uh, uh, is marginal compared to what is happening in your region. We see that 88% of the attacks occur in only five countries, being Nigeria and countries, uh, Afghanistan and countries in the MENA region. My question to you is how do you analyze the actions of the Western countries regarding your region? Because we always complain about terrorism here, and of course every person who died last, last week in Paris is a person too much. We complain about the refugees, but what is your point of view about this? Thank you. What we've seen in Paris, which was a disaster, it's against humanity, and we will be condemning it all the time. But the way that we've seen after the 9-11, it was more of a revenge strategy. It's more of make somebody pay the price rather than to have a developed strategy for the future. What we've heard before, I mean, everybody was talking about terrorism in Europe. You know, for the last, that it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. You have thousands of Europeans that they have migrated through Turkey into Iraq and Syria. And you just had the G20 meeting in Italia. And I like what was said, but it was interesting to know, how would you look into the eyes of everybody sitting around this table and then think that you're going to be achieving a more organized policy in fighting terrorism? The, the problem that we have in all of this is that we have... If we want to develop a strategy, the strategy is a multi-level strategy, from education to finding jobs, to try to tone down the political rhetoric when we are making statements. Because at the end of the day, I'm a Muslim, I'm against the, the Daesh and the Nusra, but when I hear somebody talking badly about Islam, all what I will do, I will sit aside and watch you see how to deal with it. You want us to be on your side. We are paying because with your statistic you're proving that we are the main sufferers from terrorism more than the Europeans. I hope the decision that was taken by President Hollande okay, can be sustained beyond the elections at the end of the month. Because Marine Le Pen was winning based on these issues. There was the statement that was made. I hope that they are serious because we really would like a coordination to do that. I've heard today too many statements against Russia. Okay? This is the decision of NATO. We're not party of this conflict. But Due to the lack of strategy of Europe dealing with the Syrian affairs, opened the vacuum and Russia stepped in. So instead of looking at it as a negative thing, I'm not talking about Ukraine, I'm talking now purely about Syria, let's work with them because they've already are been on the ground and let's develop a good strategy. So I hope to answer your question that what we are hearing today is not a reaction, but we would like to see a clear policy how you're going to be dealing with it, and all of us, the Arabs, will be very happy to support you because we are the biggest sufferer from all of this.